Hello, everyone. I am Dr. Michelle Villagran, Chair of the San Jose State University School of Information Diversity Committee. And we want to welcome all of you to our 2020 Diversity Webinar Series. This is our fourth uh, webinar in an eight-part series, and it is the final one for spring 2020. Now, all of our presenters, if you've attended past ones, uh, and even this one and the future ones, are fostering discussion around uh, content and topics related to uh, diversity, inclusive excellence, equity, and inclusion, and ones that you can uh, apply within your, your profession and in your positions. You will see or be able to see a full list of our sessions, our topics, our presenters on the upcoming webcast page, which I will place in the chat shortly. Uh, you all are also on mute. So um, this is for recording purposes. Each ses session is recorded and we do make it available on our on-demand uh, page afterwards for future use. And they are generally posted within two to four weeks. So you can review this later or share it with others afterwards. Now, if you have any questions throughout today's webinar, please place them in the chat box. And Yago will be addressing those at the end of the presentation. And so with that, I would like to introduce today's session, The Publishing Librarian, Becoming a Publisher, Starting a Printing Press, and Creating Content, presented by Yago Cura. So Yago, I'm turning it over to you. Uh, cool. Hi. Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Professor. Um, thank you so much for joining in and um, finding this topic of interest. Um, as the uh, professor said, my name is Yago Kira. This is uh, the publishing librarian or uh, becoming a publisher, starting a printed press and creating content. Now, a disclaimer before we start. Um, I don't have all the answers. Um, and I'm hoping that you're willing to find some of the um, really, really kind of poignant questions because I think they're a little more important than the answers. So uh, with that, um, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about who I am in the context of what I do. Um, so who is uh, Yago Kira? Um, so uh, I studied at Queens College, CUNY, um, brick and mortar. Uh, shout out to all my beautiful people in New York, uh, all over the uh, country, Oregon, um, places like that. So um, I was very lucky um, in that I was able to study something before. So from 99 to 02, I was able to um, get my MFA in poetry in the Poets and Writers program at UMass Amherst, very competitive, uh, kind of catty, high schooly kind of like program, but a very good one. Um, two years, uh, worked as an adjunct for CUNY um, at Kingsborough Community College uh, in Sheepshead Bay. Uh, which was nice for me. I was born in Brooklyn, so it was great to kind of go back. Um, I joined the Teaching Fellows Program, became a, a you know English teacher for about 10 years, um, and I've been a zinester since uh, undergrad days. Um, I grew up in Miami and um, went to FIU, and um, the scene there was was kind of like in the art department, like in every kind of college and university <laughs> over all over the country. Um, I uh, am a sometimes poet, uh, and I like to um, write things about art, and um, I like to learn about uh, art history and stuff like that. Um, this year, I served as the uh, Reform LA president. I am the proprietor of Inchas Press, which just means that I pay like all the bills. Um, I also see all of the revenue or, or share it with the, you know, endeavors that I'm doing as projects with collaborations and stuff with other people. Um, bilingual, bicoastal, um, I've been five years uh, with the Los Angeles Public Library. I'm very proud of my work with the LAPL. I'm very proud of LAPL as an organization. Shout out to all the beautiful people in the LAPL. Um, so for the past uh, three years, I've been a bilingual outreach librarian. Here's a picture of me at Placita uh, signing up this beautiful dog in a tutu uh, with a library card. Um, so that's kind of who I am. What is uh, Inchas Press? Um, so uh, it's a micro press, and that's basically just a fancy way of saying like my reach is super small um, in terms of distribution, very little. Um, so it's a handy moniker, you know, but um, I'm trying to kind of outgrow it. Um, it this, the Inchas Press comes from Inchas de Poesia, which is an online literary journal. And I was very concerned, uh, very, sorry, very uh, interested in the idea um, that Jose Marti was really the first one to talk about, which is that there's really like one America, right? There's North America and South America. Um, and, you know, 
their interests may be competing at times, but their history is shared, right? So, um, so uh, Inches de Poesia is a place for Latino writers, artists, metiches, people who are kind of like in the, you know, in the world of writing, want to translate, stuff like that. Um, there's no ads, no revenue, all fun. Um, I kind of publish what I want when I want, um, which is limiting for sure. And there's challenges there as well, but I'm not beholden to anybody and I kind of uh, do stuff all because of the love. So there's the uh, URL for the journal. Um, in terms of Inches Press, um, it was uh, something I started um, to work on uh, the first book, which was uh, Huzzles for Foley. Um, I went to grad school with James Foley and we published this book um, in honor of the work he had done as an American combat journalist. And um, so, so this, you know, Inches Press uh, starts later than the journal. Um, and Inches Press is responsible for librarians with spines, but it's uh, Max Macias, uh, Autumn Anglin. Um, these are people without which I, Jace Olsen, I couldn't do, like we couldn't do what we do without them. So sure I paid the bills, but they were the ones that built it. And, and what I suggest is that you find people that you can trust that you can kind of work with and collaborate with because um, Max Macias, Autumn Anglin, Jay Salson, the list goes on and on, have been fundamental um, to the success of uh, Librarians with Spines. We're working on volume three, shout out, please send us an abstract, a chapter. Um, I will say this, uh, there's many hats, many masters. What that means is that I am, I'm writing the press release and paying the bills and kind of working with the web designer and taking pictures for, you know, the zines that we're going to sell on the, on the website. So, um, you, you, I do a lot of the work myself, but that's okay. Um, I don't make a living doing this. And that's something that I really suggest to everyone here. I mean, I imagine that the predominantly the, there's librarians out here. So we all have day jobs. Right. But, um, you know, one of my things is like, I don't, people who, who make a living off of this, I, I find it really, really hard. You know what I mean? And that's just my experience. So what I suggest is you have keep your day job, you know, and just kind of do this because of the love. What pray tell is an incha, just to give you a background. This is in Buenos Aires. These are inchas de Boca. My dad's uh, soccer team, uh, he's from Buenos Aires. So that's his soccer team, Boca Juniors. And these are what uh, inchas are. They're kind of like a homicidal football agilence, right? Some people see them as a scourge. Some people see them as mafiosos. They're basically, they belong to that football club. The football club belongs to them. It's like a symbiotic kind of beautiful relationship. Please don't call an incha a fan. The fan ideology is like in this country is very, very different um, than like what uh, Incha is in Latin America. Um, like imagine the Incha is kind of like a Borg, but even more unpredictable, right? And they're kind of like mindless rabble, but, but beautiful. It's like football, football, football. This is what they want. So I thought, how could I translate that into experimental lit, into literature, into, you know, um, biblio stuff, right? And, um, this is where the idea of kind of becoming your own creator of content comes in. So let me talk to you what the business model really was. You know, we all understand as a professional information kind of people that like the eBooks is, is growing and will continue to grow. So what was the old model like, right? So in the old model, and the old model is like you send a manuscript to a, an agent or, you know, the office of a publisher and then they publish it and do all the stuff. Um, authors receive about 10% of the sales, right? So if you're uh, writing that great American novel and hoping to buy your first yacht with it, right? A la Fitzgerald, then like you got to move a lot of volume. Um, and it's not just about selling 30, right? So it's not, not even selling 3,000 or 30,000. It's like selling, how do I sell 300,000 of, of this thing, right? Um, so copywriters, publicists that are hired by printing, you know, by publishing houses and publishers, they're not cheap and, and they don't come cheap, right? And there's also associated costs that we don't see because we're typically not in that world. So mailing ads, like ads is a huge thing. And then even press, you know, like the kind of relationship and rapport that you have to build with media to kind of move something at that volume, right? 90% um, of the sales, if you, you know, with the old publishing model, it goes back to the publishing house to cover costs, right? 
But, you know, as an author, you're coddled and coaxed. If you're, a, a, you know, if you're a purebred, a, a, like a, a selling horse and they can, you know, race you a lot and, and you consistently come in first, they're going to coddle and coax you and, and kind of give you advances. And for sure, that's, that's how it works. Um, the authors take advantage of the publisher's network, right? So the publisher does all the work and they see very little of, of what's coming to them. But if they sell a lot, then the share gets bigger. Um, authors are protected, but also bound by contract, right? So then you have the instances where, you know, author signs to write four or five books and they can only come out with two and, you know, the publishing house sues them and there's like a bunch of other stuff that, that happens, right? So, um, there, it's like a double-edged sword, right? So the ebook business model, right? So if you're selling ebooks or if you're self-publishing and, and doing that, dealing with, you know, Amazon and, and those kind of people and getting your book out there, you typically see about 60 to 70 percent of sales, right? So what I mean is, um, so like a book maybe costs 19.95, right? And then the author sees 10 percent in the old model, but an ebook costs like six dollars. But of those six dollars, uh, ebook authors see about 350. You know what I mean? Four four dollars of that six dollars. So there's more money that you see as an author coming back to you. But if you're self-publishing, you're wearing all the hats again, right? Like you're the press release writer, you're the this thing, you're the mommy, you're the daddy. You're you wearing all the hats, right? There's no hand holding. You make a lot of mistakes. Um, you will make a lot of mistakes. Um, you are your favorite intern, like you are just doing all the work, right? Social media, those kind of platforms and applications definitely help. I'm not going to lie. Uh, MailChimp is great. Like, man, we have uh, the Inches Press is on like Square, like, you know, like website, which paired with Weebly, you know, like there's all these great tools you can take advantage of, right? Um, but, you know, uh, it's it's basically in design and desire, right? Uh, like you the ability to know the software and then to execute it to produce something, right? Um, you have to build an audience. Uh, it typically starts with your family. So you're going to definitely annoy your family and friends first and then hopefully build upon that audience. And it's really about networking, 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 right? Like how many hands can you get this book into by yourself without a distributor, right? Um, let's talk about uh, ISBNs. Uh, we all know what they are. We know what kind of purpose they serve, but let's talk a little more in depth about them and like how they actually work, um, what they cost, which is what I'm more interested in. So we all know they're unique book identifiers, right? Um, so the specs, it gives like the format, the edition, the publisher, it gives bibliographic information that people can look up in the Bowker database, right? So it's like if I have, theoretically, if I have this ISBN 13 number, it'll lead me back to the publisher like an enormous breadcrumb, right? Um, Bowker administers uh, the, I think it's called My Digital Identifiers, the website. Um, and then you get listed in books in print, which is like a, a book in print that they make and has 40 million titles. It's yearly, comes out every year and your title will be there and people can look it up and, and look, you know, on and off. Um, so um, think of uh, ISBN like a surf leash for your book, you know, like uh, you wipe out and you kind of come to this place where no one, you know, like they just, what's this book from? They look at the ISBN 13 and it leads them back to, you know, gives them all this bibliographic information, including publisher. And from there, it's a little easier. Uh, essential info. Um, the one thing I'll say is that like an audio book has a different ISBN number than a print book. And the hardcover is going to have a different one than the soft cover. You know what I mean? So every iteration has its own ISBN, which can be costly, right? It's like you start, you know, so I think about uh, uh, to have one book in all formats, including print and e-media, it's about four to five ISBNs, right? So just to give you an idea of what, the, what kind of math you're looking at, this is the Inchas Press, like ISBN, my identifier, like homepage. Like you see here that um, in that column where the numbers are, that's all the ISBN 13 numbers and they correspond to the title and they've all been assigned. Um, there's one that's incomplete. I'm still working on it. And when I say working on it, what I'm entering is um, all that information, like the dimensions, um, you know, if it's pamphlet, if it's book, how is it bound? Is it, is it printed in what way? So um, typically you upload the cover image, barcode, um, and it gives you a status. And once it's assigned, then that's, it's done. It's kind of like set in stone and anyone can, can check it out and verify it. Um, 
again, just to give you an idea, the type of specs that you're dealing with when, when you do have an ISBN number at the top, you see um, ISBN 9781, you know, so you have that sequence of number, that's the identifier. But then really, um, you're going to need four, um, I guess, categories, uh, schemas of information to enter the bibliographic information for this particular book, right? So title and cover, you can upload a JPEG, um, you can talk about uh, if it's a full color, black and white, stuff like that, right? Then the second part is obviously contributors. And so something like Librarians with Spines has many, many contributors. I think the first one was like 11, uh, 11 authors. The second one was something like 17, 18. So you can imagine you're going to spend a couple of minutes entering all the contributors, right? But that's, again, what tells people that this particular author has a particular chapter, right? We all know how it works. Format and size. Um, and so a lot of these questions, um, if you're not designing the book, you're going to have to talk to your designer about, right? So you're going to have to work in tandem with them, right? Um, and then the last one is sales and pricing. And, you know, like, how are we selling, you know, this? Or does, you know, what's the list price? What's the manufacturer price? What's it, what's it cost for this? What's it cost for the electronic version? So there's a bunch of things that you kind of have to answer there. But just to give you an idea of like what it looks like and the kind of options that you have, I guess really to kind of just really stress how not easy, but uh, it's something that anyone can do. Like I am no one special and I can enter this information and have an ISBN number and use it the way that big publishers do. Uh, I buy 10 at a time. They may buy, they may buy 500 at a time, but that's really, we, we have both of us the huge publishing house and me, the micro press, we'd both take advantage of um, the ISBN and Bowker and the service that they provide. Um, I also would advise if you are thinking about starting a press and, and publishing a book and doing this, obviously ISBN number, but also a, a Library of Congress control number. And um, the Library of Congress started this program called the Pre-Assigned Control Number Program a couple of years ago. You apply for a Library of Congress control number and they magically, they, they send it to you. There's a person that takes you know your request and and processes it and you get a mail you get an email from the library of congress which is super rad and um you know it's kind of a great way as well um the the caveat is obviously you have to send them a copy of the title right and it's within a couple of months you know so um ISBN is through Bowker, which is a commercial thing, but this is, you know, through the Library of Congress and has a different kind of ring to it and a different type of um, process and, and kind of beauty, right? So the LOC runs the PCMP, they assign the numbers, um, it, it, the number corresponds to the record created for each book in the Library of Congress catalog collections. You apply for the number, um, you mail them a copy of the title, and, you know, you add the Library of Congress control number to the colophon in the, in the front, and there you go. You know, you have another identifier um, to go with your book. So, um, when we when we talked about this, we uh, Professor Villagran and I we, we talked about like how you know this idea of diversity in publishing is nothing new. Um, lately, we've seen a lot of um, a lot of what's the word I'm looking for? A lot of um, talk, discussion, dialogue um, uh, concerning like a book like American Dirt and the Oprah Reading Club and and amazing writers like Miriam Gerba and like how they have really kind of um, talk to us about inconvenient things. Like a lot of people don't want to hear what they're saying, but I think they have a very valid point. Another valid point is that the history of literature is rife with self-publishing. What that means is that there's this idea that authors are born, right? So it's like, no, you know, this person sends the manuscript and everyone at the publishing house is so wowed. And then they publish it right away. You can hear the printing presses rolling and then they become a millionaire. And that's just not at all how it works um, with 
the history of literature, if you look. Um, so, for example, um, you know, you look at someone like Blake, right? So, like, his Marriage of Heaven and Hell, his songs, they were all written, designed, and printed by him. I mean, he actually did the plates and stuff. So, you know, the, the idea that there was this, like, publishing house behind him is completely erroneous and, and BS. I mean, so from there, to jump to Walt Whitman, it's really not much of a, of a jump, you know what I mean? But, again, you have someone who's designing... Um, just everything and, and I think at, towards I mean, he wrote like what 11 or 12 editions of it you know and I think in the first one is with the letter that he has from Emerson uh, I think because Emerson wrote him a letter a glowing letter about how beautiful um, Leaves of Grass was because he'd seen this first edition and so uh, there's like a beautiful kind of story behind that um, Marcel Proust um, Swan's Way uh, remembers of things past um, completely self-published. Well, not completely, but mostly. Um, let's not forget Hogarth Press, started by Virginia Woolf, right? Who wrote that amazing essay, Room of One's Own, talking about the challenges and limitations that, that the publishing world literature history has put on women. Um, so, um, you know, and then, you know, I recently I'm doing research and talking, you know, I mean, reading about this stuff and there's this beautiful kind of thing about Joyce crying to Sylvia Beach and Sylvia Beach was the owner of Shakespeare and Company, a famous bookstore in Paris, right? And so he goes in there crying and, you know, about no one wanting to publish Ulysses and she, she's the first one that actually publishes it in mass and then eventually in the end he kind of sells her out um and you know because ulysses is ulysses right it's like the uh, pinnacle of the canon right but you know even in 2000 you had someone like stephen king saying to himself you know what i wrote these books and i've made a lot of money but i could have made a lot more money if i had done them myself and so uh, uh like the novel the plant right publishes himself in installments i think his son now is writing you know, that same kind of way. They're like a publishing house themselves almost, right? And then let's not forget Andy Weir's The Martian that, you know, sold for a million dollars to movie rights, right? Because he actually uh, published the novel himself and was giving it away free. So, um, you know what I mean? The idea that uh, self-publishing is somehow not a part of just publishing publishing is kind of BS. And it's, uh, it's a more like a, a caste and social kind of class thing than anything. But hey, I may be wrong. You let me know. I I'd love to hear what you think. Um, another kind of real kind of uh, uh, elephant in the room is the publishing world is almost exclusively white. And the first inkling that this was going on is in 1994. Uh, on the article houses with no doors in publishers weekly right this graph is from 1994 right and you can tell overall in the industry about 80 percent of personnel staff right are a particular ethnicity um and there's lots of reasons for that um maybe one of them could be like who can afford to live on 18 and a half grand a year right another might be like well if i have to pay my own rent like if, you know, I mean, how do I do that, right? Like it, it's, so it brings up a lot of the challenges, right? Um, and so the one thing I want to point out is this whole issue comes up again in October, 2015. And what they find is that 90% um, of respondents identified themselves as white, right? So here we have this idea that like, there are certain sectors in our society that are unwilling almost, it seems, to kind of um, desegregate and kind of offer um, challenges equanimously, right? Not, not just to like a select few or to the, you know, those born into capital and, and with these means, right? Um, but I think there's more and more talk about this. There's more and more movement about this. For example, we cannot forget we need diverse books and the great, the great, great, great lobbying um, kind of work that they have done. Um, but, you know, just to give you an idea, like in 2015, five interns like were placed like with, at presses that are predominantly uh, people of color. Right. So there's still a lot of work that, that needs to kind of get done. Um, there's a, a lot of um, there's a lot of work and reflection that needs to get done. My point is not much has changed in 20 years. Right. So if you're a person of color and you're you know, you've been trying to get a book published and it's not working, 
I'm not saying it's because you're a person of color, but I'm saying that there are particular interests um, that may not be what you're trying to sell, right? And, and so there's lots of reasons they, they will say no, and maybe you should strike out on your own. This is kind of that thing, right? Where you strike out on your own and you see what's out there. Um, very, very importantly, the, the whole publishing racket like really hinges on buying ISBNs in bulk. Let me show you something that not a lot of people know about. I'm so glad I see there's 63 people here. I'm, I'm, I'm really appreciative and grateful for you guys showing up. Let me show you something that not a lot of people know and that I would love for you to spread. Um, so like you can see all the way on the right, um, so like one ISBN and one barcode, right, is going to cost you $150, right? So um, I'm thinking, okay, if I want to buy 10, I'm looking at like at least $1,150, right? But that's not the case at all. 10 ISBNs and one barcode will cost you $320, so a third of what you know, what the projection would be, right? If they were just charging us per ISBN, right? So you buy one and it's 130 or 150, depending on whether you get the barcode. You buy 10 and it's 295, right? 320 with one barcode, right? So I'm looking at one ISBN, one ISBN as 150. I'm thinking 10 is gonna cost me that much and it's really not. It costs you a third of what you think. So always the idea is to buy more ISBNs, buy more unique identifiers, right, to have them kind of in cash, right? Um, just to give you an idea, um, 10 ISBNs, 5 barcodes are 395, right? So then they give you, you know, kind of different combinations, right? I saw uh, 100 ISBNs the other day on Bowker for a little over $500, Okay, so obviously you buy 10, each ISBN is 30 something dollars. If you buy 100, each ISBN costs you about $5, right? The majority of people don't understand that. They don't know that, especially um, people that, that work with books, but don't sell them or don't kind of publish them. This is kind of like that moment, um, you know, in uh, Punch Drunk Love, you know what I mean? Where he realizes he can buy all these like yogurt cups and get all these miles, right? I'm telling you, this is the way to beat them at their game. You buy ISBNs in bulk and you wait for the projects to come to you, um, right? So this is basically what I just kind of said, you know? Um, buy more than you can handle, you know? Like I suggest you start with friends, families, peers. What, what I mean by that is think of the stories in your families. Think of um, the stories that you live, that you've lived, right? Like think of the things you've seen. Guys, we all work in libraries, you know? I mean, the only people that don't understand libraries are dynamic kind of crazy places are people that don't work there. Like we all understand we have stories galore, right? So what I'm suggesting is create the content. Like, you know, we've all written papers and had to edit them before we turn them in. That's exactly what a publisher does to a manuscript, right? So the idea that it's something that you can't do because you didn't get your MFA is, is ludicrous. Um, in fact, I think getting my MFA actually worked against me in certain ways, right? Um, what I suggest is start small, like a chat book, um, and then work your way up to collaborations, um, anthologies. Um, for example, um, you know, here, the, well, Librarians with Spines is an anthology of, of you know, library and information science articles and chapters, right? Um, but I published um, Huzzles for Foley, which is a book, you know, it's like a book of huzzles for an American combat journalist, and we're working on other stuff. We just translated um, a short story collection about queer soccer, like in Argentina, with my friend Abel Folgar. So, like, you know, I'm working on that as well. Um, so... If you have, if you buy 10 ISBNs, which is a little, this is $300, let's say, right? You get to have two books in all of the formats that you may come to need, right? Um, that's what I mean by kind of do the math and always buy more than what you need. Um, the stories will come to you. Um, this kind of brings me to the end and, and really um, what we're talking about. And, and um, I want to make sure that I, that I emphasize this, though. Um, the means of production for making books has become very bargain basement, like super uh, not cheap, but, but, but uh, 
you know, it costs money, but it's not uh, prohibitive, right? Um, back in the 90s, I mean, you know, it was expensive to make booklets and have them booklet stapled and have all these weird things that the photocopy machines would do. This is not the case anymore. Um, you can imagine there's maybe less people doing that, but there's, it's, it's become very, very, very cheap. So making, being a person of color, becoming a publisher and publishing books is challenging, but not really difficult. The real struggle the real Gordian knot is distribution. And what I mean by that is how do I sell the most amount of books that I can without being a huge publishing house that has millions of dollars, you know, that it can command, right? And, and what I'm trying to tell you is that distribution is a key to moving volume because when you work with a distributor, they do the hard work for you of contacting the bookstores and doing all that kind of work that is super tedious and just really is going to frustrate you, you know, like chasing money, chasing payments, stuff like that. Um, they have to, you kind of shift that you know, the onus of that responsibility onto the distributor. They charge you, you know, money for that. It's not like they do it for free or at the benevolence of their heart. However, I will say this as well. Um, even with the small uh, distributors, okay, there's this idea that self-publishing, that if you put together a book and you're not a person of renown or you haven't been on the scene or in the industry for very long, then, you know, you're kind of ghosted and pushed to the margins, which is, it is what it is, right? What, um, what I'm trying to advocate for you, if you decide to become a creator of content, is that uh, you possibly work with a distributor to see if they can help you to kind of get the books into as many hands as possible, right? Uh, what I mean by that is uh, if you check on worldcat.org, uh, um, Librarians with Spines is in about 83 libraries. Right, so like getting from 83 libraries to 8,335 libraries, you know, I don't even know if there's that many in the country, right? But, but getting them into like way more libraries, exponentially more, is really what a distributor can help you to do. Um, like I said, they're not cheap and they will, call, you know, they will charge you, but um, they do help. And, and to say that they, they wouldn't be of assistance is silly. The problem is how do you get their attention? The problem is, how do you introduce yourself when you're a very important nobody? Um, that's really the question, right? So you're still going to have to go bookstore to bookstore, and, and that's kind of like hand-to-hand -hand combat, okay? So like, for example, in Los Angeles, if, I'm, if I was just concerned with getting a book out, right, I'd have to call Romans. I'd have to call Skylight. I'd have to set up with Gatsby's in Long Beach. I'd, there's like a whole litany. There's a whole protocol of bookstores that I would have to engage with. You know, I mean, I haven't even mentioned other books or La Libreria. So there's a whole like list of books that you have to engage with. And what I mean by that engage is, is consignment. And there are challenges there as well. I hate to chase money. I would rather have money chase me. But, you know, a lot of people don't mind. And for them, consignment is, is okay. Um, but consignment does require what I call funds custodianship, right? Like you're the janitor of that check and you got to like make sure that it's going to come to you. Um, I will also just make sure we understand that self-publishing uh, carries a stigma. Uh, and what is meant by self-publishing most times is when you publish yourself, right? But that's not always the case. Um, let me give you an example. Uh, Volume of Librarians with Spines has no work by me. I, I don't have a chapter in there. But um, Volume 2 does, right? So to say that I am a self-publisher and that I've only self-published is kind of erroneous, you know, and a little mean, you know, because a lot of times people haven't even, even looked at the book. They'll just pass judgment on it before they even kind of open it up. Um, so really, um, you know, I want you to ask yourself something like, like who gets to publish books, right? And, and who gets final say over what gets published? Right? Like you may have a story to tell and many people don't want to hear it. That doesn't mean your story is not of worth, right? Let's not forget, especially when we're talking about publishing, um, someone like J.K. Rowling, I think she had six or seven 
um, rejection letters from big publishing houses. And I can guarantee you all of those people kick themselves right in the ass. Because um, most of the times, you know, if you just send it, it goes into a slush pile and not a lot of people engage with it. And imagine all of the JK Rowlings that have been kind of passed over by publishing houses. You know what I mean? So that that's, I, I want you to, I, you know, like, like imagine her story not being, not ever coming out, you know, she took five rejection letters and was like, screw this. I'm going to go enter like data for a living. Right. So, you know, um, who gets to publish, you know, like what, what gets published, who gets to say what gets published, right? Um, how many zip codes get to hear your story, right? If you keep it within your zip code and another, that's, that's great, but kind of limiting and challenging, right? So you, you definitely want to um, spread wings and kind of have your story have a life of its own. Um, and I think it's also an opportunity for you to kind of ask yourself if you know of a, a publisher that's a person of color, or you know, a publishing house, a small press that predominantly publishes writers of color, collaborate with them, ask them, how, how are you doing this? Please, like, it doesn't hurt to reach out. Um, I, I am available if you guys, you know, like if I have, if you have a question, I would love to kind of, you know, um, answer them. Um, these are some of the sources that I use to kind of um, talk about um, the things we talked about. Um, and, you know, I am, um, like I said, I, I don't have all the answers, um, but I'm hoping that you were able to kind of generate some really great questions. Um, and if it's okay, I would love to kind of hear some or um, maybe we could kind of, you know, do it with the chat or something. Um, so Yago, I'm sure. going to um, pop on here. Hi everyone, uh, thank you. There have been some questions come in, um, but first I wanna really thank you for your time um, with this presentation and your expertise. I think it's an area that, you know, even library students, uh, when we go to library school, we don't, we might not even consider, or once we become a librarian, we don't consider this as, you know, whether it's a, a interest, a hobby, or something we do eventually wanna try to get into full time. Um, and I heard two real key takeaways myself about sharing our stories. I think we each have so much to contribute and it's getting it out there and being able to share it and beyond just our local, uh, like our backyard. And then secondly, I was going to ask this, but you touched on it, the ways in which we can help, uh, we can impact, we can influence the culture of self-publishing as a person of color and what we can each do to contribute and get our voices out there. So I really, um, I really do appreciate this talk. And I'm gonna go to the chat. I don't know if you can see it, but there were a few questions. And go ahead, anyone place your questions in the chat if you do have um, comments and questions. Uh, there we go. The first one, this was from Jim. Um, he said, hi, Yago, thanks for your talk. I thought this might be a good thing to think um, if things get bad, you know, employment or job wise, but it looks like it, it's not a full time gig and I appreciate your candor on this. The questions Jim has are, what do you think of print on demand and your business model and print on demand in general, any insights on this from your perspective? Totally. Thanks so much, Jim, for that question. And um, just so just so we're clear, we've mostly done print on demand. I've dealt with one um, uh, one printer, uh, McNaughton Gun in like Lansing, Michigan, and we used them to publish some um, puzzles for Foley, and and they were great. But on the whole, um, yeah, you're gonna pay more money to have it printed at uh, a press. And the print on demand, the great thing about that is that it requires no capital from you, or 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 actually very little capital. For example. The, the, you know, let's say you uh, upload a book there, you as a publisher, they give you a special price to publish. So like you can print those books and have them. And like, that's what we do. We, we print those books out at a special price and we use Square Up to kind of distribute them to all points in the country, right? Um, but, you know, people, a lot of people view print on demand, again, as like this kind of, like stepchild, you know what I mean? Where it doesn't really get the importance um, that it should. And the reality is um, a lot of these prohibitive costs 
like they go away when you do print on demand, right? And really what it's about is, you know, um, getting you to put on all those hats, right? So, you know, putting, getting them into people's hands becomes more your job, not going out and trying to figure out how you're going to get $600 to print out 250 books, right? So that's a great question. And, you know, I, I swear by the print on demand stuff. Again, a lot of people are turned off by it. I get it. But um, for me, it works. Great. Um, and Jim, I hope that answers your question. Um, there was a, a question. This was about the um, houses with no doors um, that you referenced um, and the, you know, how white the profession or that aspect mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. And Ariana Kale asked, is that for North America or is it all the Americas? So you know? I believe in, in 1994, that study, um, it was a, it was, I don't know exactly who administered it, right? But the printing uh, presses, the houses were all sent this survey and it was optional to take it. P some people took it, some people didn't. Of those that reported, this is what they were able to kind of tally up. Um, but, you know, having like, um, after I got my MFA, I moved to New York because duh, that's like as a writer, that's that's where you go. Those, those were all the publishing houses are. So you're kind of like, you know, closer to all that. Um, you know, it, it, it's, uh, there's a lot of ins and outs and, and a lot of those, you know, places you can't even, you know, you can't even get through through the front door. You know what I mean? So it, it's, uh, it, can, it can get really interesting. Um, so I, so that the, the main reason I use that slide is just to illustrate that, you know, we talk about these things, but if actually nothing is done, then the things remain the same. So like, it, so like we were made aware of this in 1994 and like, and like, you know, I know a lot of companies like say that diversity is important to them and that's the truth. Right. But how do we, how do we provide for that? Right. If, do we just say diversity is important and that's like, that's how we improve it? Or do we actually build the architecture of something that is going to improve it? And my point is that for the last 20, you know, from 1994 to 2015, there was absolutely no architecture made in terms of trying to better the problem. It was all kind of like, you know, it was all spoken and, and nothing was actually built, right? And so what I'm talking about is, these are the conditions in which people of color find themselves. Mm -hmm. And these are the invisible kind of challenges. These are the invisible sensors that a lot of people of color have to deal with. Um, many like myself, like I don't have an important last name. I don't have a bunch of capital, but that doesn't mean I don't have stories to tell. And that doesn't mean I can't work with people to get them to, to kind of coax the stories out of them that they have. And that's what this is about. So, um, yeah, I hope that kind of answers the question. And again, it's it's not to, you know, it's not to, oh man, I, I really am just kind of looking at the data and saying, look, this is, this is what I see. You know, I, I remember a really great interview with James Baldwin where they asked him, you know, why is he living in Paris? And he's like, look, I make decisions based upon like how people behave with me. And, and, and I can't, in this country, it's, it's just not happening. The people's behavior tells me that I'm unwanted here. And that's kind of, I'm, I'm, I'm massacring Mr. Baldwin's like, you know, interview, but like what I'm, what I'm trying to say is something very similar to, right? I feel for in many instances that we are kind of, our stories are a little unwanted or there are stories that they think they know how to tell and they don't. We've seen that with like a lot of the television shows that are on Netflix now and this whole idea, you know? So thank you for your question. That's a great question. Excellent. I know uh, Max had a few comments about, um, this is also directly related to information literacy and that inf information comes through a very small lens, which I agree with both of those. Um, and then Max had a question, will Hinches be branching out into non-print publishing? That's a really good question. You know, I, I think it, we're all seeing, we're all seeing now that whether you like it or not, it's it's a good idea like i think before this pandemic you know i do outreach a lot where i used to get from from people like oh and and i'm the same way i would prefer a physical print book but i will use an ebook in a jam like if if i need to get the info i don't care i can i'll look at it on a ipod i really don't care right but 
if you're talking about preference, I'm always, I always prefer the book. It's, it's just like how we as humans, our hands, it's almost like perfect for, for, for the tactile kind of experience. So to say that a any publisher to say, <laughs> it's like, you know, it's line in the dirt. We're not doing anything electronically is like, <laughs> it's like a Monty Python skit. Like there's no one would do that right now. So most definitely we're looking to kind of do that. And maybe that's the way that we get into more libraries is maybe not having a print book, but you know, because the print book involves the library uh, sending me an invoice and, you know, sometimes it's like six months for some of those invoices mm -hmm. to kind of, you know, clear. And again, I'm not bad mouthing the hand that feeds me all that stuff, but I am saying, Again, uh, what I call funds custodianship. I'm just not down. Like I have a regular job and a family and a wife and uh, a, a, I don't know, a chinchilla farm I need to tend to. I don't have time <laughs> for, you know what I mean, to, to kind of uh, run after money that people owe me. Um, so it's really just a practical thing. But thanks for that question, Max. That's a great question as well. Definitely. And you have many other questions. So I'll continue here. Cool. Thank um, you. You're welcome. Angel had a question. Do you have any resources for persons of color publishers to collaborate with? Is there a list? And I'll add on to that. If there isn't a list, can we start one or do some research and put together a list? Most definitely. Um, and I can, uh, there are so many uh, resources on, uh, like online. Like it, it's really, um, it's really dizzy to, to be fair. Um, so, you know, five years ago, there was, we, we need diverse books. And now if you look on Facebook, there's like, you know, like Latinx publishers, there's like myriad, 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 myriad Facebook groups and, and stuff like that. Um, you know, what I would suggest Angel, is, is really, you know, you create the list and it's going to be Angela's list, right? It's going to be like the things that you might might see important or might find important and i would love for people to be drawn to that list right because you're, you're seeing it with like new eyes right so like as a person who may be getting more into this you know i'd be interested in seeing like your list and what you think is kind of like important right so so i don't know there's definitely room for that um let's not forget that you know like even some like fact sheet five you know which is was started was like a review of zines right that a dude published and he was just uh, independent publisher, you know, like you, Anke, hopefully one day will be, right? So thank you for that question. Great question. Um, Christopher had a question, uh, well, statement and a question. I want to republish public domain technical books that's utterly out of circulation. Any advice for publishing things that aren't literature or that are out of circulation? Um, yeah, yeah, for sure. And, and thanks for talking about circulation and, and that whole thing. You know, there's a lot of like pitfalls and snares and you got to be careful. And, you know, we're all we're all working libraries. So we know, you know, these things come out of copyright and you can use them. They come into the public domain. And I completely. So so here's what I suggest, man. Um, let's say it's a manual for carpentry that was 100 years ago. Right. Um, I would work with a graphic designer or someone that would make an interesting cover. I would reach out to uh, someone at a technical college or that owns a business in which, you know, they, they do a lot of that work and ask them to write an intro or a preface. Um, I guess what I'm saying is, man, um, if that's your thing, reach out to people who know about it and who aren't afraid to put pen to paper. Because there's lots of expert guys, but there's, there's not too many people who are, are on unabashed who are who are not bashful like a lot of experts are really they really are very careful with their words and what they say and there's very few people who are just going to be very generous and open with you i guess what i'm saying is go the generous and open route if it's about woodwork you're talking about talk to woodworkers talk to people in the profession talk to professors and people who study that history you know what i mean and then go from there and the book kind of writes itself the content is already there i guess what i'm saying is make sure you build a really sweet house for this book. And, and how are you going to do that, right? Uh, again, work with a graphic designer. Have them build something that's really nice. Maybe you're, maybe you're thinking about a wood print, right? It's obvious. For a woodworking manual, a wood print would be super, super appropriate and, and, and really aesthetically pleasing, right? So these are all things we know. So, man, go with your gut. Like, reach out, collaborate, open it up. Like, you can't solve this problem on your own and people are going to help you. I guarantee you. Thank you for that question.
That's a great question. Great ideas um, and suggestions. Um, here's a question from, I can't see the full name. It says L-O-R-E, but it says, hi, thanks for your talk. I have a question about contract, contracts with the authors at many presses. How much percentage do authors get paid? And do you recommend a website with good examples of contracts or rather what would be the best way to deal with that? Sure, so I'm going to be completely open and honest. We do not pay the authors that collaborate on librarians with spines. And the reason is because the money that we make is just not enough. <laughs> and so that's a, that's a great question. Um, I'm going to be very honest in terms of contract. Um, you know, you can, you can definitely get one uh, off the internet. And that's what I suggest, you know, just for, you know, just so it stipulates what, what the people, what people should expect. And, 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 and you're very transparent. For example, with us, they sign a contract saying that they're going to appear in this, in this publication that we cannot pay them, but that they are getting two um, copies of the publication, like in payment and they sign their name to it. And that's pretty much it. Um, in terms of bigger projects and, and like what those things are worth, um, you're not gonna find something on the internet. It's gonna be really hard to find something on the internet. For example, if uh, someone wants you, is contracting you to write their biography, right? You, it's gonna be really hard to find a contract for that on the internet uh, that is very transparent with you. So you kinda, you're gonna have to figure out how many hours it's gonna take you to work on this project and then come up with like a, a per hour number Right. So if it's like 70 hours and you're like, man, I'm, you know, 20 hours, you know, so that's basically what you would charge them, you know. Um, so think about how many hours a project's going to entail and think about what your worth is hourly. And then that's what you that's what you put in that contract. You know, what I mean, which, again, you can just kind of get off. Um, the internet. But but again, this is a great question. Now, with other publishing, uh, with other print houses and stuff like that, you can guarantee that the contracts are way more complex, way more, they stipulate way more, and they're very, very, very direct. You know, like there's certain things that you cannot do. If they pay you to write two books, man, you got to give them two books. You can't give them a book and a half. I mean, you can give them a book and a half, but your career is over. Right. So it's like, you know, I'm, I'm actually reading a book, The Last Taxi Driver by Lee Durkee. And the, the main character is actually a person who wrote a book and then just couldn't write the second one. And so it has to drive cabs. You know what I mean? They used to work at a college and stuff. So I guess what I'm saying is um, as a self-publisher, you know what I mean? It's, it's a lot easier, a lot less complex. Um, as a publisher, publisher, your bottom line is you, you have money to make and you're going to hold people to that contract. And if you try to break the contract, uh, yeah, it gets it gets so ugly. And because, again, I don't have I don't have money for lawyers. You know what I mean? As a self-publisher, most don't. Um, and they know that, too. The big the big publishers know that. And, and so do a lot of the people. So, you know, you have to you have to tread lightly. That That's a great question. I, I hope I've answered it like, um, you know, it, it's like I said this is not a day job. I mean, like, don't quit your day job. Like this is, this shouldn't be your day job. Like this is, this takes years, you know, to really kind of cultivate. You could strike out like, you know, let's not forget um, Paul Beatty's a sellout. Um, uh, Marlon James, um, that novel, those are, th those both were, were small presses. And, you know, the one won the Pulitzer and, you know, the man Booker. So it's like, it can happen. You know what I mean? It's not, it's not about that, but, you know, it's like a, a gambling thing, right? So it's like when you go to Vegas, you know, you may win four thousand dollars, but the house is going to win always. You know, so you have to be you have to be uh, careful and tread lightly. Uh, contracts are great for that, and small presses typically pay their contributors in copies. So thank you for that question. That was a great question as well. And Max did point out that money does go back into creating and promoting more volumes. So let's remember that too. For sure. And then let's not forget, like, especially with librarians with spines, like we sell it for twenty two ninety five, right? But then I'm responsible for mailing it out. And each book is about two seventy five. Mm -hmm. Like if I get if I get a carrier that's like cool and like we're chill and I can get the media rate, 
And it's like 275. If not, if they kind of hassle me and they're like, whatever, and they start asking a lot of questions, it's like 325 or something like that. So you gotta, you gotta realize that's three dollars off of every book. So the book that you know we're not really making that, we're making that minus the postage and minus this. And you know, I I run I run this and and Max, you know, with Max, we run it out of our homes. <laughs> you know what I mean? So like. You know, it's uh, we're a pain. I imagine our wives, you know, are really sometimes hate us, you know, because there's like boxes of books and crap. You know, I, I can't speak for Max. Max wife, Rani's beautiful and she's great. I just speak for my wife and I drive her crazy. I can attest to that for sure. But she's amazing and so humble and so beautiful and so amazing. And she tolerates me. And that's all you can ask. Um, here's a great question about um any books or uh, resources, I guess specifically books, you would recommend to get started or get more in depth on self-publishing and becoming a small press? Is there one title that you would recommend? Let me tell you why that might be fraught with a little, um, not danger, but like the books that are published, teaching people how to publish are there to sell. And, and, and that's obvious, right? I guess my point is, is I would trust more, I would stick to Library of Congress, like what I can learn from the pre-assigned control number thing. I would stick with Bowker and like the commercial stuff that they tell me about that stuff and like how to think about it. In terms of books, it's kind of like self-help, you know what I mean? Like self-help is, I feel, always trying to sell you something, right? So they're trying to sell you this way. I guess what I'm saying is eventually I get to the point where they try to sell me something if it's a book about publishing and I'm completely against that. Like I'm the whole point of this is, is a DIY kind of ethic. And it is this idea that like, look, the thing that separates me from penguin house is millions of dollars of capital for sure. They have staff of thousands. They have millions in terms of capital and a publishing history. I have none of that, but there's certain things that put me on par with them. And I guess what I'm saying is I stick to those things because those things are the, the things that I can touch. Those are the real things. Like the real thing is uh, Penguin has a Bowker account and they have hundreds of ISBNs and they have a person whose sole job is to, you know what I mean, to shepherd those ISBNs, mm -hmm. right? I don't. I have maybe 20, okay? And so I can do it on my own. So the scale is much smaller. I'm I'm so sorry. It's not that it's not that, you know, if you gave me like a day or so, I could probably find like a book or two that's a little better. You know what I mean? What I would recommend actually uh, is from my work as a poet, like you have the poets market. So depending on what genre, buy the uh, market book for that year. And actually, that's how I would do um, my research. And that's how I would kind of emulate the things that I would like to do is I would check the websites and the aesthetics and the business plans, you know, like how how they do things of uh, presses, websites, uh, journals that I like and admire. You know, that's really so don't 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 get a book, but get the like if you're thinking about starting a poetry press, get the Poets Market 2020. And just kind of leaf through it, you know, look at, you know, places that accept um, contests and stuff like that and see how they do things and how they run things. And that's where you'll get a better idea. If you go to a book, you're going to get a line and someone's going to try to sell you something. But again, you know, maybe maybe look around too, right? Using self-publishing or, you know, keywords like that. You know what I mean? That'll get you something. Um, that's just my two cents, you know, but that's a great question. And thank you for allowing me to express it like that. You know, I appreciate it. When also, Yaga, and I think you mentioned this before too, looking at those, say those Facebook groups or other locations that social media to see if there are any networking groups that might have conversations about this that address what um, that specific genre. Oh, no, no, for sure. And and like I said, if, if you look closely, like I know for, for a fact, like in Los Angeles, you, you have like writ large press and they're like a, a press that publishes poetry stuff. And like they, you know, I would consider them a person of color press, you know what I mean? And, and the books they put out are great, but they've also done programming. They did this program a couple of years, a couple of summers ago called 90 for 90, or they did 90 programs in 90 days. And let me tell you, man, they're not making millions of dollars. That was all love and connections and rapport that they were able to build with people again what i'm saying is we don't have the capital we don't have that money but what we do have is time 
And what we can build is rapport. And once you build rapport and make those connections, people will actually probably do the work for free. If, if there's that rapport, if that's that, that general feeling that we're in this together and we can do this together and you're collaborative, I guarantee you money is not going to be an issue and everyone just kind of throws their defenses down. So, so that's just one example. You know, like I haven't worked with them much just because my, you guys can hear my, my baby is in the back. Like uh, my life is somewhere different and I, I don't know when I can work sometimes. You know what I mean? It's, it's kind of a little harder for me, but there are presses owned by minorities that are minority run or and, and mostly published minorities. There are bookstores out there that are really taking the, the charge and really trying to, like other books in LA, I mean, phenomenal, ph phenomenal in terms of like who they're trying to reach, the programming they offer, like I think better than libraries, you know, they're, they're, they're doing programming that is way more, uh, look at, look at Libro Mobile in Santa Ana. I mean, there's, it's, it's there, you know what I mean? Like it's there, but you do have to reach out. You do have to come with with your, you know, with, with open, you know, open palms and, and just like really in an, in a, in a spirit of trying to learn how to do this. And I guarantee you people will, the opportunities will approach you. You will not have to look for opportunities to publish things. You will talk to people, you will mingle, you'll network. And all of a sudden they'll be writing to you and asking you what you think and if you can help them with this. So, you know, it's, it's a great opportunity to kind of, you know, be humble and just kind of learn and and that's what i've been trying to do for the past 10 years and i still have maybe scratched the surface you know i think um well we're at the top of the hour and i want to be really um cognizant of that because our time is um, critical so there are several questions yago and some great resources um the individuals have asked and shared so what i'm going to do is i will send those to you after this. And if mm -hmm. you can respond to those, uh, and just in a sure. word document, and then mm -hmm. we will post those answers mm -hmm. and those resources with um, the recording on our website. So everybody can get those answers um, afterwards. That's super rad. No, no worries. I, I did want to say one last thing. Mm -hmm. Guys, you know, even though there are a lot of um, obstacles to publishing and, and you know, you're definitely going to be learning a lot. I did also want to make the case for um, there are lots of public library systems and academic ones that are really trying to ensure that minorities are publishing and that there is a hail and hearty and almost kind of like um, just a very vibrant ecosystem of publishing. So just, you know, in terms like LAPL has resources, LAPL, you know, um, collaborates with independent authors in English and in Spanish. And I'm not just talking about telling them titles recommending. I'm talking about working with the California Center for the Book and a bunch of other entities. So uh, you don't have to reach out to public library systems or libraries. There are nonprofits, organizations that are there to help you. California Center for the Book, California Arts Council. There are myriad, myriad, myriad uh, people out there willing to help you if you can write a cogent proposal. So please reach out, but don't forget, a lot of these resources have been under your nose. You just haven't been looking for them. And your work as a librarian, that always happens to me as a librarian. I'm always like, oh man, it was, it was right there, you know, but I just, I wasn't, I wasn't looking for it. And so I wasn't able to find it. So maybe now that you're looking for these things, recheck the, you know, the kind of home pages of, of your public library. And I guarantee you, man, you're talking about Austin, you're talking about Los Angeles, you're talking about New York, you're talking about like Portland, Seattle. I guarantee you those public libraries have collaborations with independent publishers and organizations at the state level that you can take advantage of. You are not in this alone. It is not your problem to solve alone. That's the one thing I want to leave you with. Reach out, be humble, learn as much as you can. And you know what? Ask for help and people respond. They always respond, you know? Um, so, so, you know, with that, I really appreciate it. I don't want to take more time than, than you know, you guys are, are long. So I really appreciate the time and the patience. And I'll definitely get back to um, all your questions. And please, uh, inchestpress.com. Uh, we're selling zines. We're selling copies of Librarians with Spines. I'd love to put one in your hand. Thank you so much, Yago. This, again, was so informative. And I really appreciate everyone that's attended, as well as your time for putting this together and sharing your expertise with us. So with that, thank you everyone, and we will be back in touch, and you will be able to see the recording and those answers to those questions we did get to 
and the resources um, on our website within two to four weeks. So thank you again. Gracias y un abrazo gigante para todos, para toda la gente en el internet. Okay, thank you and a big hug and uh, for everyone on the internet. Um, let me know if you have any questions. I'd love to answer them. Thank you so much, guys.